Okay, there we are. Got it. Cool. Okay, there we are. Awesome. Let me just share this real quick on my other page. I should have a um, different way of doing this, but. Okay. All right. Well, I want to welcome everyone uh, for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate it. I'm Odette Ramos, your councilwoman for the 14th district. We're doing these town halls now monthly uh, just because I think people are zoomed out as uh, Dr. Jones and I were talking about earlier. So uh, we're uh, going to be doing various topics um, around um, each each month. And uh, so today we're um, focusing on really black history here in the district. Uh, and I'm excited to talk about that. But we're, we're, before I do that, I just wanted to um, do a couple of reminders. Uh, first is uh, there is a new program called Water for All. That is a um, program, it's a new dis water discount program so that we can, um, residents can afford our water bills. And so uh, please sign up for that. Um, you can go to the Water for All website by just Googling Water for All Baltimore um, or call 410-396-5555. That is the uh, number for the community action centers and they will walk you through the process. And if you're in the old discount program, the BH2O, you have to reapply uh, for Water for All uh, because the income calculation is different. Um, so it's a, gonna be a great program. I'm very excited about it. If uh, folks are having um, trouble, let me know. Um, also, we're in the midst of tax sale season. As you know, we work hard in our district to make sure that no one's house is um, sold on tax sale. And so we are um, going to be working on that again uh, this time around. Uh, if you have received a final bill and legal notice and are worried about uh, paying the taxes or liens or whatever it is, please, uh, or, or think it's a mistake, which it could be, then um, please also uh, contact me and we will work through all of that. Um, so those are some of the big things happening um, right at the moment. Um, I uh, will, so we're just excited that um, some of these uh, things are happening and um, look forward to working with all of you on that. So you don't want to hear me talk anymore. You want to hear about what our um, fabulous historians have to say about um, the really amazing Black history that we have here in the district. Um, and uh, so I'm very excited to have Dr. Ida Jones from Morgan State University, an archivist uh, from Morgan State University. And she wrote a book about Victorine Q. Adams, um, who is, uh, was the first African-American woman to be a council person uh, she didn't represent this area, but she is being honored here. Um, the name of the new Gilcrest building is uh, in honor of um, Victorine Q. Adams. So I'm um, so excited to have uh, Dr. Jones here and she'll impart her wisdom for us in a minute. And then many of you know uh, Joanne Robinson, she's my neighbor um, and also um, our local historian who will talk about um, schoolhouse Garden, I called it square in my in my note, but it's Schoolhouse Garden, um, and also Gertrude Williams, uh, who is uh, who was an educator. She's my constituent um, and a and a head of her time um, educator, and had um, a huge impact on our students. I wanted to first uh, talk about. Um, I I wasn't able to find uh, somebody to talk about this one, so I'm going to talk about that real quick. Um, so. Hose Heights. Hose Heights is in the um, northwest corner of the district, um, just above Hamden and um, below Cold Spring Lane. And it is a traditionally African American community. It was uh, founded by um, the, its, its name is after a farmer, Grandison Poe. And he was a freed black man who came to Baltimore and had that plot of land 
uh, was um, he was able to purchase uh, and one is, was one of the first um, black farmers in the area. And so that area has continued to be primarily an African-American area. His family still had the land um, for a long time. Um, and then it was um, sold uh, to make those developments. So um, a pretty important, um, you know, we wonder what some of these neighborhood names come from. Well, that's why it's called Hose Heights because it was the, the Ho, H-O-E um, family um, farm. Uh, and uh, obviously makes still an impact today uh, because the namesake uh, is, is there. So um, I, uh, am, I believe that's gonna be one of the, you know, the Baltimore Heritage is doing, does a lot of these five minute videos about various amazing history in the city. And I don't think that they've done one for Host Heights yet. So I'm gonna ask him to do that so we can learn much more about this very important um, uh, farmer that was in the area. Um, and, and of course it remains, um, it's changing, but it remains primarily um, a black neighborhood in the midst of many other um, neighborhoods, uh, white neighborhoods in particular. So it's very interesting how that, um, how that plays out in terms of how our geography ended up um, playing up. So um, that was one I wanted to, to uh, highlight for you. Um, and so we'll go to Dr. Jones uh, first. And I wanted to, you know, Dr. Jones, tell us a little bit more about um, this wonderful, um, you wrote a whole book, so you're not going to read the whole book, but <laughs> at least just give us a sense of, you know, who she was. Um, I will say, just to give you all a sense of timing here, Victorine Q. Adams served with Senator Mikulski when the senator was in the city council. She also served with Mary Pat Clark when Mary Pat Clark first became in the city council. So to let you know how important this is, Victorine Q. Adams was the first black woman to be elected to the city council, not even 40 years ago. So the fact that that, I mean, just sort of the history here, you'd think that because we've been a majority black city, we've had so many um, people in leadership, but actually not really until recently, which I think was really interesting. Um, so Dr. Jones, take it away from there. Well, good evening, Councilman Ramos and colleague, Dr. Joanne Robinson. So good to see you, dear. Um, so it's a Morgan moment right here and a Hill and Road moment with all of this. I, I just had to do a quick search and realize that the Lowerville community is not in the 14th district, of, I guess the modern 14th district, but Morgan State has been at the corner of Hill and Cold Spring Road for over a hundred years and moving there in 1917, but the university was founded in 1867. So just a brief bit of history that uh, because uh, Victorine was a Morganite as well as a cop and normal school person. I think she fits. Oh, okay, so she was in the area. Yeah, I yeah. do have a tiny bit of Morgan um, <laughs> south of Argonne Drive. So okay, I have the Montevillo okay. building. I have the Northwood Fields. I have the so, and I'm very, very proud to have part of Morgan in my district. And I'm getting even more of Morgan in my district when they move to um, Lake Clifton schools. <laughs> so. That's right. That's right. We're opening a satellite there. That's right. Yeah, so yeah. I just want to make that relevant for your constituency. Yes, that you thank you. To be, Keep going. Um, selective, although you are one of my friends, and so I do have an affinity for her. There is there is context here. Yes, go Morgan. Thank you, Hillen Road Improvement Association. So just very briefly, the five W's and the one H. So who was Victorine Adams? She was a native Baltimorean. She was born on April 28th, 1912 in the Johns Hopkins Ho Hospital, not hotel, hospital. And her parents, one father was native and her mother was a migrant from the Eastern shore. And so the quills, there's lots of quills still about the area. Um, but uh, she was um, a hybrid of a Maryland couple. And she was educated in segregated schools her entire life from elementary school all the way up through the cop and normal school that was created for African American women to obtain their teaching certificates. And then at Morgan State College, because she graduates in 1940, when it becomes a state college, it doesn't become a university till 1970. Four. At any rate, so, so what happens is that she goes into teaching one of the feminized professions, teaching librarianship, social work and nursing with the pink collar professions. So she chose teaching and she taught for a number of years in the Baltimore segregated school system. It wasn't until about 1947, 46, when she created the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee. Maryland did not ratify the 19th Amendment till 1941. 
We just celebrated the centennial of suffrage in 2020, but Maryland chose to lean with the Southern states and ignore the voices of African-American women and choose to not legislate that particular piece of, um, not legislate, ratify that piece of legislation. So she creates a club. And so 1946, now that the vote has been approved and black women are gonna be going to the polls, she actually bought a machine and created an organization to help women understand the power of the ballot, to understand the principal needs of the ballot. They had been kind of surrogately helping African-American men who were enfranchised in the 1870s and had wavering levels of voting capacity for various reasons. But now women had their own ballot and their own ability and their own voice. So this organization sought to teach all women about the importance of the ballot and of course the larger community and then children to make them very uh, conscious citizens. So this becomes her kind of trajectory from the classroom and teaching to more didactic instruction in the community and civic engagement. So in 1958, she creates another organization called Women Power. And I've actually met a number of women of a certain vintage who were members of that organization. Um, and she basically creates a chain of female African-American leadership all the way to the mayoral seat over the course of her life. Her legacy leads to that kind of height. And a number of the women actually are current state um, Oh goodness, Adrian Jones actually was a member of Woman Power. So that lets you know the heights to which Woman Power and Victorine's influence out of that corner of uh, Baltimore has been so impactful. So then what happens, she runs for the state Senate in the 1960s. She goes from educating and voter registration and voter activism to candidate. And she's elected to the Maryland State Senate in 1966, 67, or 65, 66. She decides to step down within a year because there were two other women, African-American women at that level. And she decides to run for the city council. She sought to bring a compassionate ear and voice to the council. She was very much a humanitarian, almost akin to what Senator Mikulski is. She was actually a social worker before she became a politician. So you tend to find women doing these quote, feminized professions that really kind of now lead them to want to become policy wonks to make sure that the policy can actually meet the people where they are. So she becomes the city council woman in 1967, the first African-American, but not the first woman. There was a woman who replaced her husband in I think the 1930s. I was trying to scramble for her name to see if she might've been a resident of your district, but I couldn't find that. So she wasn't the first woman. She was the first African-American woman. And she chose to wear that badge with a level of pride. As uh, Councilman Ramos said, there was both Mikulski and Pat Clark who were in that community with her. And Mary Pat Clark re recalls that um, then Mayor Schaefer refer to her and Senator Mikulski as city council girls, but he never referred to Victorine as that. He always called her Councilwoman Adams. So Mary Pat Clark had a very lovely kind of reverie about that in terms of Donald Schaefer. So as we go through this, what one of her most remarkable things were was the Baltimore Fuel Fund. Just hearing you talk about the idea of water and being able to have access to basic tools of civility that she, after the uh, not flood, there was a snowstorm in 78. I remember the 78, blizzard of 78, and it paralyzed the entire East Coast. And so people had had their fuel and utilities turned off because they were in arrears of their payments. And several persons died in fires from trying to alternatively heat their homes in Baltimore City. And as an ardent Catholic, she was outraged by this. So she creates the Baltimore Fuel Fund, which was a public private partnership to be able to help people pay the arrears of their bills which was about $200 at the most. So now it's against the law to do that. So I wanted to pull Victory out of the shadow of her husband, little Willie Adams, who we all know for various reasons, but to kind of let her stand on her own feet in her own way. And so that's what I sought to do as a Morganite, as a Coppin woman, as a Baltimorean, and as a politician. So I gladly can take questions and I want to thank you for letting me have a chance to spend time with you. So she, um, you know, she, she was able to sort of do what a lot of us do, which is, you know, get upset about something and then make, you know, decide to change it. And um, very interesting story about William Dollar, Donald Schaefer and um, the other women in the council um, as well. And uh, that's so interesting. Yes, I've, I've heard uh, Councilwoman Clark talk, um, you know, as well as Senator Mikulski, uh, very highly of um, Councilwoman Adams um, and really learning a lot from her as well. Um, you know, not just about the council, obviously, but just about, you know, 
I mean, it was her idea for the fuel fund. It was, uh, so they, they, they speak very highly of her. Um, and so I, I'm really glad that we can um, honor her legacy here in the district. Um, and uh, yes, the Gilcrest is named after both her and her husband. Her husband was also very uh, big in sort of democratic politics and all of that as well. Um, and I, I did not know that um, you know, Speaker Jones was also part of her, of uh, Councilwoman Adams, you know, uh, I guess she really knew that she would have to pull people with her. Um, yeah, it's amazing you know, a to lot me. Of, yeah. Yeah, I do we, good dead history, but apparently this because she died in 2006. There are women who right now are legislating and sitting in offices because of that woman power organization to build the confidence to know how to legislate as a woman politician, because either you're too icy or you're too this. There's very derogatory statements women elected officials face that men don't face. And some of the oh harshest yeah. they're women. Believe me, <laughs> still, let me just tell you. <laughs> so. <laughs> Reaching to the yeah, choir. And, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and apparent, you know, obviously she believed that she needed to to bring, you know, people along. And, you know, all of us do. And I feel very strongly about that, you know, as well in, in my role. We have to make sure that uh I, I'm definitely not gonna be the I'm the first Latino, but I'm not gonna be the last. And so, you know, that's an important um piece and obviously she felt the same way. So that's um, that's really amazing. I, I just didn't even know that um, Speaker Jones was one of her protégés. So, um, and I, I really think Speaker Jones is amazing. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. And, um, you know, if anybody wants to uh, know more about, um, uh, you know, Councilwoman Adams, uh, they can certainly, contact you, but also Google the book and, you know, buy it at Urban Reads over over here on Greenmount Avenue, because she does have it there. Um, <laughs> let's keep the theme here, a woman-owned bookstore, Black woman-owned bookstore, um, very important. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, and so um, I, I know as Joanne Robinson, I know she is Dr. Robinson as well. So I want to make sure to give her her, her props and uh, also from Morgan, um, but I asked Joanne to, to speak um, about um, two things that are, uh, you know, a big deal in our area. Um, Schoolhouse um, Garden is actually the uh, area right by the um, Waverly Market, the lot there, and there's a, a, a history, an important history there. Um, and then she'll uh, go into Gertrude Williams. Um, so I will um, uh, mute myself so that uh, Joanne can come on. And thank you so much, Joanne, for coming on. I know, I know. Uh, there have uh, been some challenges, challenges but I'm glad to be here. be here. I'm very glad to be here too, and thank you. Um, Dr. Jones, you were so succinct. Um, I'm gonna try, <laughs> but Gertrude is so close to my heart that I don't know how well I'm gonna do, but don't cut me off. I, I, Tried to keep it short. Um, for with regard to the schoolhouse garden, it um, is a set of sculptures of a teacher and students. And if you've shopped at the market or gone to the concerts at Waverly Commons, you probably at least have seen them out out of the side of your eye because they're right there by the Commons. Um, and they memorialize Waverly Colored School 115. It was erected, if you can use that word even, in 1888. It was a couple of wooden shacks heated by a pot-bellied stove, and it was where black children and black teachers were going to school in the age of segregation. Um, and the, the kids who went there, we le later learned, called it the chicken coop. Um, a group of experts from Columbia University School of Education came to Baltimore in 1929 and did a survey of every school in the city. And they found that 115 was the absolute worst structure for children. They said it's not fit for housing children. They said it was a fire trap. They pointed out that the outhouses were foul and they were right next to the drinking fountain. And they insisted that it should be demolished immediately. Now that was 1929. Kids were still going there and black teachers were still laboring there after the Brown decision in 1954. In 2007, I was teaching an oral history class at Morgan and Morgan students interviewed some of the alumni of School 115. 
And to a person, they talked about how angry they were about the conditions under which they had to go to school. But they also talked about how much they loved and appreciated their teachers and how they got a good education despite everything because of those wonderful teachers. When Barclay School opened in 1959, the, shortly around that time, uh, 115 was finally gotten rid of. But anyway, we thought that it was so important. And Joe Stewart over in Waverly is really the mover and shaker behind this, uh, who got this garden and a, a plaque as well, commemorating one of the first black teachers in Baltimore City. Um, I'll just mention two people who were alumni of 115 who were very much a part of our neighborhood. Miss Betty Williams, who grew up on Barclay Street in the 3000 block. Um, she went on to become an educator and she loved to point out that when she was ready for high school, she had to travel long distance to get her high school education when she could have walked to Eastern High School, which was segregated and open only to white girls. But in 1970, having become a teacher and then an administrator herself, she walked into Eastern as the principal. Um, and then there's Dean Patricia Welch, who became the Dean of the School of Education at Morgan State um, and also served on the school board. And I always thought, you know, when she was on the school board making policy for this school district, this was the district that had relegated her to a school that wasn't fit for the housing of children. So. Those are the kinds of things that we're trying to lift up by having the schoolhouse garden. So the next time you go to the farmer's market or go to a concert, stop and spend a little time in the garden. Well, Barclay is I definitely where- definitely will. I definitely will. I definitely will. Definitely will. Good. Um, Barclay is where Gertrude Williams would become principal in 1971. So I'm gonna dive into this now. She died this past September. Um, she gave 49 years of service to the Baltimore City Public Schools, and the last 29 of them were at Barclay. And kids from Harwood, Abel, Remington, Charles Village, and far beyond came to Barclay under her tutelage. Her whole purpose in life was to insist and to fight for the right of every child to an excellent education. And she believed that education was the fundamental path to freedom. Um, she became the kind of person she became for multiple reasons, but I want to talk about three influences on her, particularly as, as I go through the, the trajectory of her life. Her mother, Mamie Wallace Williams, um, her college, Cheney State Teachers College, and the, the, the president there, Dr. Leslie Pinckney Hill, and the first black superintendent of Baltimore City, Roland Patterson. Gertrude was born October 1st, 1927. She was the next to the youngest of eight kids, and she would be the first of them to get a college education. Her parents believed that the schools in Philadelphia, the white schools in Philadelphia where they lived, were the most, um, were much better schools than black schools. So she, they sent their kids to the white schools. And Gertrude remembered her mother saying to her, you don't have to go home with white people. You don't have to eat with them. You just have to get that education. And she followed that advice pretty well. But one day when she was in history class, the teacher with her sitting right in front of him went into this diatribe on the natural inferiority of black people. And she could not, she could not control herself. And she jumped up and she told him everything that was wrong about what he was saying until he put her out. And she went to the principal's office and the principal put her out of school and she went home and told her mother what happened. And Mrs. Williams and Gertrude went back to school the next day. And Mamie Williams said to him, I teach my children that they must never be rude to adults. So Gertrude will apologize for being rude, but she will not apologize for what she said because I do not teach my children to bow and scrape. That made a profound impression on on Gertrude. And of course, there was a lot of discrimination in, in growing up in Philadelphia. So when she earned a scholarship to Cheney State Teachers College, we now know it as Cheney, uh, in Cheney University of Pennsylvania, um, she was just so overjoyed to be in an all black environment. And 
she just loved having all black teachers and learning black history for the first time. And she was very much under the sway of Dr. Pinckney Hill, who was an advocate for um, what he called um, voluntary segregation. There have to be places like HBCUs where black culture can be nurtured and appreciated and preserved and passed on to the next generation. And even though there was a lot of uh, work going on toward desegregating all kinds of facilities and so forth, he was not part of that. Um, but the other thing that I think touched her even more deeply was that he always said that becoming an educator didn't mean you were getting a job or you were following a career. It was a vocation. It was a calling. It was a, it was a sacred calling. And she really internalized that uh, point of view and that kind of, of feeling. When she graduated from Cheney in 1949, she became part of the colored division of the Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, and she was assigned to teach sixth graders at Charles Carroll of Carrollton over on Central Avenue and Orleans Street. When she showed up at the school, the principal took one look at her and reassigned her to teach second and third grade because she weighed 85 pounds and she was not quite five feet tall. Um, while she was at Charles Carroll, she worked on a master's degree at Temple University on the weekends and summers in reading. She believed that the foundation for all education began with reading, and she wanted to become a reading resource teacher at that point in time. This was also when, as many of you probably know, um, the state of Maryland would pay for black people to go get their professional degrees in other states but they would not open their professional schools to anyone black in this state. She did get a certificate as a counselor from Loyola College uh, in 1965. By then things were changing. And then she changed from uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton over to an all white school, what had been an all white school called Mordecai Guest up in the 4,000 block of Cold Spring Lane. That building isn't there anymore. But she was stunned when she got to that school. It was so well kept. Uh, she opened the storage closets and it was full of materials and supplies that she would have given her eye teeth for to have had when she was scraping to get just the basics for her kids at Charles Carroll. She earned quite a reputation for herself at Mordecai Guest as a very gifted educator and as a kind of diplomat. Um, and she was encouraged to become a uh, administrator and in she did in 1969 she was assigned to Barclay School as the assistant principal. Uh, after two years parents went to Roland Patterson who had just arrived in Baltimore from Seattle and asked him please make Miss Williams principal and he did so the first black uh, superintendent of Baltimore City Public Schools appoints the first black principal of our school at Barclay. Patterson was a change agent uh, and she was very, he and she shared a lot of things, this passion for equal opportunity, getting parents involved in big ways, um, the importance of reading and so forth. He tried to do a lot very fast and he made many enemies while he was doing it. Um, and probably the worst thing he did for his own sake was to get on the wrong side of William Donald Schaefer our mayor that you just mentioned earlier. Um, he lasted four years, but it was a really rough four years. And at the, at that last year, 1975, the Board of School Commissioners held hearings in the War Memorial Building, laying out all of these spurious charges, which were never substantiated against this first black superintendent. Larry Gibson was hired as his attorney to try to defend him. And Gertrude went to every one of those sessions and she testified on his behalf. Everybody else was just keeping their heads down in the system, but she had poked hers up. She was 46 years old by that time. She had always kind of, she'd always been feisty and pushy, but she had always worked under the radar. Um, in no way could you call her a public figure, but the wheels just seemed to begin to turn as she began to think about ways that since she was now known as a troublemaker, and she'd been warned that this was a serious thing in this city. 
um, she might as well start making, to use a John Lewis phrase, some good trouble for the kids of Barclay. So she announced that Barclay is everybody's business. Um, the parents, the neighbors, the community associations, the merchants, the, 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 the institutions, and that she needed everybody to know that there were these great kids at Barclay. This is what she was trying to do for them, and she needed their support. So she really began to build a base uh, for herself and, and what she wanted to do at that school. She had a way of starting innovations without asking permission, and that led her into getting into a lot of skirmishes with the bureaucracy. But she ended up bringing pre-K and all-day kindergarten to Barclay when those were hardly heard of at that time. Um, and she did all kinds of other things to just try to make life better for the teachers and the kids. Um, when it was decided by the community and her that we needed a middle school at Barclay, this was in the 1980s, she um, got into a little bit of a bigger struggle with the, with the powers that be. And so that was less a skirmish and more a little battle. But the blockbuster campaign came in the um, later part of her career when she had just decided the Baltimore City public school curriculum is useless. She said it was a patchwork of fads. It was incoherent. It did more harm than good. Teachers couldn't teach by it. She wanted a curriculum from a private school. Now, at first glance, and when people first heard that, that sounded awfully strange. But in fact, there were uh, experts in education who were kind of saying the same thing. Up in Boston, Deborah Meyer, who had transformed so many schools up there, had said, um, we need strategies for giving everyone what the rich have always valued. And Charles Payne, historian, sociologist, black historian, sociologist, had written in his book, um, elite schools are hardly my idea of the best we can do, but treating poor children as we treat rich children looks like a pretty good idea. And he stressed how important it is that every kid needs work that requires stretching their talents. This is what Gertrude wanted for, for Barclay. And so she went to Calvert School up in north of up on Tuscany Road, and she proposed that the Calvert curriculum be implemented at Barclay. A very traditional, highly structured curriculum. Um, it echoed the way that she had been taught at Cheney, actually, and the way some of her supervisors in the very early days of the, her teaching had forced her to teach. She created a storm of controversy throughout the city. There was a new superintendent in town, Dr. Richard Hunter. He said, no, this was a rich man's curriculum. Gertrude said, we didn't want a poor man's curriculum. She was attacked in some areas of the black community for being a, apparently a, a pawn of the white power structure. Um, she was chastised for not showing proper respect to the superintendent. But others, both black and white, rallied around her. And finally, Kurt Schmoke, the mayor of the city at the time, intervened on the side of the Barclay Calvert, and he accepted the resignation of Richard Hunter. Um, from 1990 to 1994, then, the Barclay Calvert project was just a stellar project. The response of the kids and the teachers and the parents was so dramatic that the outside evaluator said, this shows there's nothing wrong with urban children. We shouldn't talk about at-risk students. We should talk about the at-risk ways we deal with curriculum and methods. Gertrude became a celebrity. She um, and the school, there were articles about them in Reader's Digest, in the New York Times, in Essence, even in The Economist. Um, visitors poured in from all over the country and even some parts of the world. She was on national television. She was called to conferences all over the place and it became overwhelming. Um, after she retired, she and I sat down and recorded her oral history, and we wrote a book called Education is My Agenda. Um, and she said, I began to feel like I couldn't keep up. I'm just not famous. All of the publicity took me out of what I am. 
So the next four years from 94 to 98, when they tried to expand the curriculum to the middle school, it didn't go so well. And when she retired in 1998, the man who replaced her as principal, David Clapp, um, said that he, the pressure from the school system was just too great and he couldn't sustain it. He said, once Miss Williams was gone, school officials were going to bring Barkley back to earth. And he took the brunt of that. In her final reflections for the book, she said these two things, and I'm almost at the end of my effort to be succinct. Years of blood, sweat, and tears went into making Barclay a symbol of the right of every child to an excellent education. If the new administrators understand that they must keep fighting for that right, Barclay will thrive. If they fail to understand, Barclay will become just run of the mill. But whatever happened, she wanted to be clear about how much she loved the Barclay School community. She said over and over again, it was a pro-education community. I loved my teaching and my counseling, but all the joys of education came together for me at Barclay. And I'll just close by saying that surely those joys came together also for the students and the families and the communities that she empowered. Thank you so, Thank much, you so much for that really just amazing description of that, of the history. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this because we don't often hear that um, history. I didn't realize that she was the first black principal in the city. Um, and, uh, you know, that her, um, insistence that every student deserves a stellar education. And it wasn't that, you know, black students were worse than whites. It was the system was the problem um, is, is important too. And actually one of our attendees here, uh, President Brown from uh, BTU is here. She's my constituent as well. I wanted to welcome her. Um, but I know that, uh, you know, um, uh, Gertrude Williams was really an inspiration for so many. And I have to say there was a, one of my constituents um, shortly after um, uh, Gertrude Williams passed, uh, wanted to, to work on naming, renaming the school after her. And I think would be fitting, frankly, um, but also, uh, you know, I'd love to um, make sure that we do the, the right um, honoring of her, of her legacy to make sure that people don't forget. Um, it's um, really important that, um, so I'm really glad that you wrote the book and that you've been very active in keeping um, her legacy um, alive because it's been really just, um, it's, I've just learned so much just in the last, <laughs> That's one of the best things about my job. I learn something new literally every day and um, get to be able to celebrate, you know, such um, amazing work. So the other thing is I didn't realize you had mentioned Larry Gibson. Larry Gibson, also one of my constituents, um, you know, was there. Uh, I didn't realize that he was part of this story um, around the Roland Patterson issue and, and um, Gertrude Williams. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, former Mayor Schmoke, um, you know, he uh, was very much um, involved in this as well. And, and, I, and I, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but there's this great photo of Gertrude Williams, who's, those of you who know me know that I'm pretty short. She's shorter than me. And, um, and she's looking up at some of her students. Um, but, you know, she commanded such a presence as uh, a teacher that she was always very well respected. Um, and so I, I'm sorry, I did not get to a chance to know her better. Um, also Councilwoman Clark also speaks very highly of her um, as well because um, she's, you know, Gertrude Williams has done a lot. So I, I did not realize that she, you know, really has uh, played a huge, I mean, her discovery of saying we've got to get Calvert curriculum, but Calvert also in my district, by the way. Um, so they're, you know, part of this, um, getting that curriculum into the school and then saying, you know, children can do this. Uh, you know, the fact that she made that revelation, she knew it, she didn't make a revelation, she knew it, but she got everybody else to know it um, is important. Oh, do you have the, the picture there? <laughs> 
yeah, we could see it. Yeah, there she is right there. So yeah, amazing, really amazing. One little correction. She wasn't the first black principal in the school system. She was the first black principal at Barclay. Still very important. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so that's great. So thank you very much, Joanne, for bringing that um, to us. I really, really appreciate it and appreciate you both uh, bringing them these. This is amazing stories. Um, and we have, uh, there will be other historians coming, um, you know, after all of us talking about all of you and all of us um, and talking about some other uh, women in particular who are making black history now. So some that I wanted to point out are um, Senator Mary Washington. Um, she is uh, the first um, out uh, lesbian um, uh, in the Senate uh, and, so we, um, you know, are, uh, it's awesome to re be represented by her. Um, we have a, uh, an amazing uh, couple, um, the um, uh, Nicole um, Foster and her husband Dwight. Uh, they are the owners of Cashew Ice Cream, which is a vegan ice cream. Um, they are obviously the first to do that here in the city um, and are really making, uh, really part of this movement, um, along with um, Debonet over at um, uh, My Mama's Vegan, uh, around changing how people are eating and, um, and eating more healthy and being a part of that, which by the way, the theme for Black History Month is, this uh, month is actually around wellness um, and health. And, um, you know, we've also seen that many of our, um, uh, one of the doctors that was part of the um, discovering the, uh, or being a, de developing the COVID vaccine, um, uh, also uh, African-American woman. So very, very poignant. Um, so we have folks today also, um, you know, making history. So it's very exciting um, to be a part of that. Um, and again, I just wanna thank um, both of you. Um, didn't know if uh, Dr. Jones, you wanted to add anything or um, any of our guests have any, any of our guests, any of our attendees have any questions. Um, but yes, I agree. Very great presentations today. Really appreciate it. I have a copy of your book, Joanne. I'm going to have to get you to sign it. And now I'll have to crack the cover because it's on my shelf. It's on my pile of things in Baltimore to read. So you brought her alive to me and I definitely am, am get, feeling an itch. I'll have to get the book. Yes, it's, yes. And actually uh, it's uh, uh, the book about uh, Gertrude Williams is also at Urban Reads as well. Um, so um, yeah, I asked her to order some so that people can. Um, so that's that's good. And Dr. Jones, you have here in the chat when we talked about Betty Williams and uh, Dr. Welsh, they have collections at the archives. Yes, I had the pleasure of meeting Betty Williams. She was quite a sassy lady. And when she told me she was 90 plus, I couldn't believe it. I mean, because she was driving her red convertible Corvette with her, you know, mink stole. At any rate, and um, so she uh, bequeathed to us some materials because she actually graduated from Morgan in 1944. So we actually have her yearbook from 1944. And um, she was just quite a quite a remarkable person. Once you met her, you could not unmeet her or unforget her. And she's a member of the Du Bois circle as well, of which I'm a member. So uh, both her and Dr. Welsh. So it was just really kind of full circle to know they attended that particular school that you mentioned. And I pass Waverly, that park every day in route to work. So I'll have to make an effort to kind of do um, something there. When I, now that I know the land has some significance beyond what I see. Thank you. You're still mute, Joanne. Yeah. You're on mute. There we go. Okay. I have this wonderful image of Betty Williams at the dedication of the schoolhouse garden, sitting in the front row with her stockings with little butterflies up her up her stockings and just dressed to the nines the, the rest of the way. That's she always. She always was impeccably, fashionably dressed, no matter where she came. Yes, I'm looking forward to having a, a new eye when I go over there um, as well. So we have a question in the chat for Joanne. What's the state of um, education and the curriculum um, now post uh, 
Gertrude Williams, both it, both in Berkeley and in uh, I think citywide as well. Is that question? I believe Gertrude would say run of the mill. Um, I don't know that much now about the whole system. I, I'm not that much involved. I, until I got sick, I was still going to meetings at, at Berkeley, um, and they're really struggling there. Um, and whether it's curriculum or whether there are other factors, it's uh, it's certainly not anywhere close to even before Calvert when Gertrude was there. And it makes me so sad because we have a neighborhood full of toddlers and and people who should be sending, getting ready to send their kids to Barclay as I did and as many people in Abel did. Um, and it probably will not happen. Well, we, I mean, admittedly, we didn't end up sending ours. So that's, that's kind of what, I mean, because we're just a down the way. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, it's tough. So what would be her advice, you think? What she did in, in making Barkley everybody's business and getting everybody behind, we had, we had priorities meetings where we invited the whole community to come in and talk about what they wanted in the school, the parents, the teachers, neighbors, everybody. And it was actually out of those priority meetings that she decided it was time for a middle school at Berkeley and that she decided there was something really wrong with the curriculum because so many people were worried about how the kids just weren't getting the reading and the writing and the basics. And so that push from the community, but you have to have the kind of person that Gertrude was who was wanted that and who was open to it and who knew how to work with everybody. Um, but I, I wish our community, all of them from all of us from Harvard and Harwood and Abel and all over could come together and have a, our priorities meeting about what we want for our neighborhood school and and start to push from outside. I'm not sure it yeah. would be welcomed, but but mm -hmm. but something that's what she would say as she said you have to fight you have to keep fighting if you're going to have uh the kids here get the same kind of education that the kids are getting in the counties where they have no problem with money and supplies and good teachers we've we've got to get it here too we have to fight for it yeah i think that's a good point we have um uh, you know, we, we do send our daughter to public school, but, you know, I think a lot of families have had to make that decision and it's, and it, I mean, we're guilty of it. You know, we could have easily tried to gather folks together to say, let's make this happen. I know there are some parents that are starting that work. Um, Laura from um, St. Paul Street and a few others. So hopefully we can uh, be a part of that kind of movement um, as a neighborhood um, as well. And then be a be a voice for the rest of our, our schools. Um, I think it's that's extremely it's important. Um, and the other thing that I know is happening at Berkeley, which I think is a great thing, um, but there needs to be extra support, other supports, is that the Latino population is growing in that school. We have a lot of Latinos moving into Better Waverly, and so um, uh, I do know that they need more supports, uh, for, you know, in terms of um, language access um, and. Uh, they put out a call for more teachers uh, who are uh, who speak Spanish. So um, I think uh, I think that is an important step for all of our um, now that our population is growing all over the city, <laughs> and so there's going to be additional uh, resources that are needed. Uh, so, but I, I do think that it's a it's a good thing. So um, it's uh, I'm you know grateful for. Um, you know, I'm grateful for uh, Gertrude Williams and all of the work that she did, and hopefully we can all follow in her footsteps uh, and, you know, bring education to be, you know, that um, that uh, high priority. So, um, well, I appreciate everybody uh, coming on today. Uh, this has been really wonderful. I'm, uh, I'm really excited about um, the history lesson that we got today. Uh, always uh, great to learn more about how important uh, Black history is both citywide but also here in the district and that we have 
uh, such uh, wonderful historians that have been keeping it track for us. <laughs> because if we don't have historians, we can't remember what's going on. So um, really appreciate uh, Dr. Jones and uh, she's Dr. Robinson, we all know her as Joanne. <laughs> um, and uh, grateful for to both of you for taking time um, with us today and, and imparting your, your knowledge. So thank you very much uh, for being here. Thanks to everybody who participated here on Zoom and also on Facebook. Um, this uh, will be on YouTube later um, as well. So folks can still um, pass this around and get the, your history lesson um, as well. Um, next month for March, um, we're either going to do a, a women's history piece um, or just to start getting ready for spring. I'm so sick of winter. I'm ready for spring. And so we have, you know, all of our greening and tree folks that might uh, come on as well. So we'll let you know about that. Um, and uh, we have, as we get closer to budget season, we will do a town hall about the city budget and looking at what your priorities um, as my constituents might be for the budget as we go into that season. Um, it's a very important topic. So Joanne, did you have one last thing to say? Yes, I, I wanted to, to tie in with Victorine Adams and now with the budget, because an, another thing about Gertrude's work with the community was she was always telling them they had to be engaged. They, she, there was always a Barclay presence at taxpayers night. She took people to Annapolis. Um, they needed to understand the inequitable funding issue at that level. And, and so it, she was a great admirer of, of Victorine Adams and, and something of a, a follower of, of the kind of power that, that she wanted to see built that Victorine was working on. I'm on mute myself. Um, so she, uh, and that, and that is, we don't always um, make the connections about how important being involved with, you know, uh, watching the budget or watching, you know, things happen on the legislative side and how much it impacts. I mean, we just went through this whole battle with the governor and luckily he came to his senses where he had taken out $99 million that we needed for our schools and at least he put it back in. <laughs> but that was a battle. The city council came together. Everybody came together to make that happen. And so we appreciate that. But it was uh, it's those kinds of things that, you know, because if we don't have the, the funding, um, I do think the budget is one of the most important things that we have to do as a as a legislative body. Um, I'm not on the Ways and Means Committee, but I go to every single meeting um, because it's that um, it's that important. So anyway, so thank you very much to the both of you for being here for, you know, keeping the legacy and the history um, for us. Um, and uh, we'll continue to lift up as many opportunities to be able to learn um, about our history as well. Um, and thanks all of you for joining us tonight. And we will see you um, next month or anytime out in the community now that we're out and about. So I look forward to seeing everybody. Thanks again. Take care now. <laughs>